Welcome to the Politics of Everything. I'm Amber Danes, your host and podcast producer. This is a half hour of power, a podcast dropping every week where I unpack the politics of everything, from money to motherhood, nutrition to narcissism, startups to secularism, the environment, equality, and much, much more. Our guests are seasoned in the field or topic of their choice, even if you've not heard of them yet. This is a non-partisan show. So while I love exploring varied views and get a buzz from a healthy debate of ideas, this is not a purely blue, white, green program. Please subscribe, tune in and enjoy the politics of everything. The E word means different things to different people. Personally, I love exercising, or maybe I love having exercised. The jury remains out on that one. But I've always moved, and my own health demands it, mentally for my anxiety and physically as I have a severe scoliosis, which was diagnosed when I was just seven. And it was either maintain the body I have or face drastic surgery by 14. Even today, if I don't lift weights, spin, stretch, and walk to get my endorphins up, my day is literally a struggle on all fronts. And in my spare time, I horse ride. But many people struggle to find that momentum to move, especially as busy careers and demands of life take hold. Based on latest available ABS data, why over 3 in 10 or 35% of adults aged 18 to 64 don't sufficiently physically active every day? And more women, about 40% of us, than men, 32%, did not do the recommended amount of physical activity And this is probably a bit surprising to a lot of us who probably grew up, you know, running around doing all the things we love to do as a kid. Two in three or 70% of children, two to 17, do not make the minimum exercise guideline requirements. So enter a new health book and that's by my guest today, Dr. Brett Lilly, who talks about how to rekindle our love of exercise and offering a 10-step process to get moving, change behaviours and reap the benefits. Rediscover Your Athlete Within provides a practical guide to help you reconnect with your inner athlete. And written for anyone at any fitness level, Dr. Lee draws upon two decades of experience to help rediscover our passion for movement, becoming more present and mastering our own futures. Brett has practiced in his Sydney clinic for over two decades and is now living in Tasmania with a chiropractic master's degree under his belt and many postgrad studies spanning across different disciplines. He's focused on helping his clients find answers and solutions to muscular skeletal conditions and other issues in chronic pain. And Dr. Brett has recently moved, as I mentioned, to Tasmania because he loves the outdoors. We just had a bit of chat about that. And of course, he's mentioned this in his book trail running so let's chat today about the politics of everything when we focus on exercise welcome brett thank you good morning podcasting remotely can be challenging but it doesn't have to be since day one of the politics of everything i have relied on zencaster's all-in-one solution to make the process quick and painless the way it should be for those of us who just love great content and want to get our ideas out into the world if you know me i'm obsessed with quality in terms of my guests my sound And everything about my show has to be great the first time. I'm time poor. It's so easy to use Zencaster. I'm not tech savvy and you don't need to be either. There's nothing to download. Just click on the link and off we go. Zencaster is all about making your podcasting experience easy. And with everything from local recording to automated post productions now in their toolkit, you don't have to leave your browser to get that episode done and done fast. I have a special offer for you and I hopefully you can experience what I have with Zencaster. Go to zencaster.com forward slash pricing and use my VIP code, the politics of everything, all lowercase in one word, to get 30% off your first three months of Zencaster Professional. How good is that? I want you to have the same easy experiences I do for all my podcasting and content needs. It's time to share your story. Okay, childhood reflection. Do you recall what you wanted to do when you were a kid for when you grew up? Was it an athlete or something else? And how did that early career kind of take shape? Growing up, I grew up beside the bush. I was always active outside in the bush. And we grew up, you know, all our cousins, we were a city, all our cousins were country. So all our holidays had to go visit our relatives. So we were out farming, sheep, cattle. So I guess there's a lot of of outdoors in my early life. But growing up, I wasn't really too concerned about what I was going to do as a career. I didn't really think about it until I was in my, I guess, year 11, where my biology teacher came back one day from a weekend, fascinated and talking about platypus. And I really got caught up in his story and kind of got interested in doing science. So I began my, I guess, my career as a science degree. But moving through life, I was 
hanging out with a girlfriend whilst I was doing my biology degree, zoology degree. And she used to go see this chiropractor and she had scoliosis. And I was fascinated by this whole process because I'd never seen it before, never been exposed to chiropractic or, or even really physiotherapy. But I was actually a pretty avid cyclist back then. And I was very interested in tri um, triathlons. So seeing this chiropractor and understanding, you know, this process of chiropractic, it's natural working with the body really kind of fascinated me. And I guess it kind of tweaked my biological mindset. So I really kind of started to shift in my third year of my degree into chiropractic, pursuing more anatomy along those lines. Yeah, wow. But my career really changed when I had a motorbike accident. And that was when I was 26 now. It was my second last year of chiropractic school. And that's pretty much what changed my perspective, not just on health and rehab, but also just on what chronic pain is all about. Mm, absolutely. I think when you experience chronic pain, you know, you understand, obviously have more empathy for others who are going through that as well. So getting to our topic today, why does our capacity to want to move our bodies change over time? And I'm thinking of myself as a kid, you know, I basically couldn't sit still. I was a bit of a tomboy. I was very sporty and I came from quite an athletic family. My father was a champion runner and things like that. So we were always out and about and doing bushwalks on the weekend or going to the beach or, you know, just kind of doing a whole bunch of team sports as well. Obviously we get busy, but I feel like you're kind of desire to want to do it kind of lessens and what's your sort of I guess observation of that I guess life um, life changes life gets busy you know we start to move in to careers different family we're trying to save money buy a house and so our values start to change and what we're trying to do starts to change so the importance of being active and doing those activities hiking and being out with the family start to to change so time becomes a big factor the conditions become a big factor. You change, you move out of home and, you know, your perspective on life starts to change. So that's a really about mindset becomes a big part of that conversation. Yeah, absolutely. But also, yeah, and I think the time thing is huge. I just, yeah, I just suppose it's that thing of, not even sometimes it's like you have, so even if you have time, sometimes it's like, oh, Netflix or go for another walk or, you know, like it just becomes, I don't know, I feel like you, you don't have as much energy. Just to hang out on. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, no, it's just an interesting thought. And I think it's a good place to start our conversation today. And obviously, your book has a really catchy title. So do you think everyone has an athlete inside of them? And why do you think so? Because I think some people are obviously more physically predisposed to, you know, physical activity and other people will struggle with that. Mm. The concept really began more in clinic, seeing, you know, the clinic I was running start to move a lot more into chronic pain and so, you know, you've seen people in um, long stories, big stories about their life, they come in talking about pain. I have this problem here and trying to help them in that world and giving them tools to, to move past that or get out of that situation and help their bodies heal. But also it became, became more about the mindsets like, well, there's a person behind this story, behind this pain. So yes, you might have tissue damage or an injury that you're carrying, but there's also a story in the way you're going about it. And that's kind of really where the idea began because we started to talk to people differently, you know, and it's just like an athlete. An elite athlete has to train to push to get, to get a, you know, a PB, a, a better time and constantly progress to get higher and higher. And it's almost, you know, on the other end of the scale, if you're talking about chronic pain, you've also got to take people through that same process. So, you know, what is it they're trying to change you get very specific about or deliberate about what they're trying to change, but also working more with the person behind the problem as well. Yeah, I think that's an interesting process to kind of go through with, I guess, your patients and the people you've worked with as well. Mindset, something you touched on a little bit earlier, obviously for athletes, that's everything. And I have two children who are in elite sports at, at a private sports school here on the Central Coast. So I know all about the work on their mindset as much as their phys physical development as well. How can we embrace that in our everyday so that we are kind of match fit, if you like, and can kind of take on whatever we need to? Because of course, as we get older, life gets busy and we're not always athletes, but we obviously can change our mindset around how we think about our bodies and movement. Mindset's a big topic. I mean, in the in the book, I really break mindset down to internal and external sort of parts of that. There's an internal core, which is 
you know, your ability to put in work, to, to follow through, to persevere and to grow. So there's a grind, grit and growth process to that, which is a very internal driven, um, which is more about inspiration in many ways and how we influence ourselves to actually want to do things. But there's also an external part of that too, which is, you know, our conditioning, our proximity, the environment we live in, the people we hang around with, but also, you know, the role models we grew up with. All of this shapes our lives and also, you know, our inner circle, the people we hang around with, our our buddies are a big part of what shapes a big part of really who we become and what we're doing. So to incorporate more exercise into your life is really about how big a decision you make that, how important you make that in your life. So capacity from a mindset point of view is, you know, recognizing where you are, what, you know, what are you trying to deal with at the moment from a physical, but also emotional thinking point of view, the way you're talking about things to yourself, the way you talk to yourself, how you make decisions. What would be an example of that? When you talk about that self-talk, what would be something that you could say to yourself that would help maybe get you into the right mindset from your own experience? I think getting into your own mindset is really, you know, one part of what we look at is is looking back into your past and how you've dealt with situations previously, how you've talked to yourself, what sort of decisions you have made in the past. So you can really lean in on what's worked for you in your past and then start to bring that into your daily lifestyles, changing your proximity. It could be using affirmations, could be using visualizations, or it could be just, you know, hanging out with people that sort of you reinforce those concepts that you're already believing in. Absolutely. No, I think they're all good good tips for us as well. Obviously, staying on track is key. You know, a lot of people might, you know, relate to things like weekend warrior syndrome where you might, you know, do cycling 40 kilometres twice on the weekend and then you sit on the couch and sit in your car and sit at your desk for the rest of the week. How can we make it less of a chore to move regularly, particularly if we're time poor? I think there's this idea that you have to have an hour or two to exercise and if you don't have that time, is no point at all, but sort of I imagine there's some, some micro exercises that we could be doing just to even prevent some of that fatigue that we might feel in the afternoons or those things which make our body ache. It's really um, creating your own version of it's well, it's more about leading an active life. So, you know, t- the, uh, the concept of 10,000 steps is a great example of that. It's not so much trying to do it an hour at once, but it's what you do over the whole day. So, incorporating, you know, inconsequential movements is is a big part of that when you need to go to a meeting make it a longer journey to get there take the longer route you know rather than taking the lift take the stairs so these are all really great ideas but what you're trying to really do is bring in more activity into your life and that's a an approach to your life it's like well rather than just sitting in the car so much I might try and walk a little bit further so you're, you're injecting more of these ideas into your lifestyle so rather than trying to pump it all into one hour at the end of the day, when you're less likely to follow through, you're tired, you're, you're more likely to hit the couch in the evening, you might start off, get up in the morning and just go for a walk. And it might be just around the block. Why does it have to be an hour every time? Exactly. I think that's the thing. I think it's that all or nothing approach to exercise, which maybe if we've come from structured exercise, like we've been in team sports when we're younger, or we feel like we have to go to the gym and do a whole 45 minute class, we might Mm. sort of throw the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak. So I think the way in which we can kind of think differently about movement is probably the key to some of this. Would you agree? And even thinking about your definition around movement as well, like what is movement? So we've used the term athletic. And often when we think about an athlete, we think about young, elite, someone who has a lot of time and they're training a lot. But, you know, really what we're looking at with rediscovering your athlete within is finding your version of what your athlete is, what your wanting to do what you're capable of. So, you know, why does it have to be at the gym? It could be in the garden. It could be in the kitchen. It could be just going to a dance class. could be hanging out with the kids and running around the park with them. Yeah, and I think during COVID we got pretty good at that because the gyms were shut. Like I am a gym person, so Mm -hmm. it's like we all went out and, you know, bought all these weights and (laughs) created, you know, exercise at home because we kind of had to. So I think it's sort of – that flexibility around it sounds like it's the key. And the other thing in your book, which I I loved, was that is your why big enough? You know, is it how do you step out of that comfort zone and, and those rules and beliefs that you have in your head? Yeah, I think that's really all part of that 
And of course, you know, as we age, a lot of us have physical limitations. You know, in my 20s and 30s, I used to run half marathons. I don't do that anymore ah. at 47. Yeah. God, <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm one of those really crazy people that, you know, just love, I just love endorphins and exercise. And, you know, for me, it's non negotiable. But of course, things that happen, like you get sore hips or, you know, you don't have enough time to train. So you're not going to put yourself under that level of stress. Some people might have heart conditions or may have had surgery. How can we adapt our exercise so we're still feeling like we're doing enough, but of course modifying that for the conditions and the age and stage of which we're at? Well, again, that comes back to your definition of what you're trying to do, what your definition of an athlete actually is. And as you create your own version, you know, a lot a lot of what we're trying to do, I guess trying to do a marathon is, are you trying to do a marathon in two months' time or are you trying to do a marathon in two years' time? So you start to also think about, the timing of your training. So one of the big concepts we have is something I call slow burn, which was developed God, 20 years ago by Stu Middleton, an ultra distance runner. And one of the things he always talked about is we're trying to fit so much into one week. Why not do it over three weeks? And so you're starting to change the timing of what you're doing. So one of the concepts to answer what you're talking about in slow burn is finding your own pace of doing exercise. That's a big part of it. We're conditioned to try and do an hour every day or turn up to the gym five times a week. Why not try and do five times a week over three weeks? So you're doing 15 sessions. You miss one session or one week's busy. You can start to move it around into a second week or a third week, spreading that, you know, timing out a little bit. So finding your own pace is a big part of that. Absolutely. Pain for some is a motivation. I know for me, as I mentioned, having had a scoliosis um, most of my life and, and if I don't move and I don't stretch and I don't keep active, it's actually the pain is worse than sort of lying in bed and so forth. What about for others? It might be a bit of an excuse, if you like. How can we kind of navigate that if we're kind of you know, I think sometimes a generation maybe older than me was, you know, you got to rest when you're like in pain as opposed to you actually need to move your body and you need to do things which are kind to your body but also are going to help you long term. How do you kind of guide some of your clients, if you like, through that? Pain is a big topic. I mean, pain is hard to see. You know, we can, yeah. we can do a physical damage. You might have an acute injury where you've fractured a bone. We can see that on x-ray without a problem. Someone in chronic pain, you know, you're relying on what they're telling you and their story and your assessment, but you're also starting to find out more about their world, how they interpret that pain, how they live with that pain, and that's that's almost their perspective on the world. So pain is a, a big discussion from an external point of view, what we're conditioned to believe, which is kind of what you were touching on as well. Your know, pain is this, pain is that, you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do that. But pain is also a very internal thing as well. So there's a very big biological impact. Yeah, and uh, that's it. And I know for some people, you know, they, I've seen sort of, I guess, health programs where they've talked about the fact that chronic pain can cause depression, for example, because, you know, obviously you're feeling like you can't, you know, you're immobile or you're in chronic pain. Obviously that has a, an impact on your mental health. So that's probably part of what you work with with people, I imagine, as well, to try and get them to be more mobile because it has other, if you like, you know, other ramifications beyond the immediate pain. Well, you know, there's a lot of research coming out now of how much pain, you know, how much of what we feel we hold in our body, depression we hold in our body when we exercise and move, we tend to shift and change. We have an effect on depression around us as well. So research is catching up with that. There's um, a great book that's just come out more recently called When the Body Says No. And that's when what a great title. Other than your title, that's pretty catchy. <laughs> that might be your next podcast. And you know, that person yeah. was talking about the fact that you know there's a lot of hidden things in our body or elements in our body which we don't realize but start to evolve over time and burst out. You know, there's only so much we hold in our conscious on the surface, but there's a lot that bubbles up deep down inside, and that's kind of really where pain touches in on as well. So there's a biological response to pain. There's also a plastic, a brain response. Brain can be learned. You can learn to have pain. You know, wow, that that's idea incredible. Of why is this person always in hospital? Because when they're in hospital, lying on a bed, all these family members who they never really see start to come and visit them and give them attention. So you know, pain can be attention-seeking, um, as well as just the physical element of tissue damage, which is most of the time of what we talk about. But your know, tissue damage is much more of an acute episode. 
Chronic pain is when you start to move into different elements. And particularly too, when pain's been around for more periods of time, that's when it becomes more what's called neurogenic um, and neuroplastic, where the brain is starting to make changes as well to try and adapt to the ch- to what's happening as well, to the lifestyle you're starting to live. Yeah, big, big topic, of course. And obviously, um, you know, something I might think about for the future. So thank you for planting that seed. <laughs> so, <laughs> why does exercising come more naturally to some? And is that about the genetic lottery? Like I feel for me personally, despite the fact I have a scoliosis and I'm, I'm managing that, you know, I have a fairly traditionally athletic body. I've got strong legs. I'm quite tall. I'm lean. A lot of that comes down to the genetics, particularly on my late father's side. So for me, things like running and moving was not really that hard when I was a kid. It gets harder as we get older, of course. But what do you think about the idea that it's it's natural versus learned in terms of, you know, I guess how we hone some of that athletic ability? Well, as um, human beings, you know, our evolution is being physicality. Our ancestors chose a very physical way of lifestyle, and that's the discussion of evolution. That's also nutrition, not just physicality. But, you know, a lot of it also comes down to what you're born with, you know, your genetic type, your blueprint, which is kind of what you're talking about. And obviously aging is part of that process. So I guess a a way to define aging is aging is like a photocopy. You get a a picture that you photocopy and photocopy and our cells are dividing constantly. And each time you do a new photocopy, it's a slight difference. There's a slight loss in definition so every time there's another photocopy that's kind of like the years of our life we're losing the the crisp clarity of that picture and that's cell division but there's also um brain i mean i use mindset which is your perspective on the world as a big part of that so whether you you know it's what's henry ford's great quote whether you can or whether you can't is is you're right what is it? Yeah, it's, in, it's yeah. I know what you're saying. So basically, it's up to you. It's how you see it. And if your body says it, if you tell your body it can't, it obviously will go with that. Is that is that's kind of what I imagine you're getting to? Even one of my friends, Martha's mum's, um, you know, her GP said you're old now. You've got arthritis. You shouldn't be doing this, and you shouldn't be doing that. And you should modify your lifestyle. So of course, she spent a lot more time indoors. But one of her close friends who's riddled with arthritis, has had two hip replacements, is out active. She's up walking every morning, using her body, going playing lawn bowls, and constantly saying to my friend's mum, you should come out more. And she's like, no, 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 the, the, you know, I've been told that that's not good for me. I need to slow down now and take more care about my body as well. So we get conditioned quite quickly without realising, you know, how strong and how powerful the messages are around us as well. So there's an and external. I think for some people they, they could feel like that's a way out to not have to exercise. You know what I mean? If you're already sort of struggling with your body, if the if the medical professional says, you know, you shouldn't be doing this, then that's probably a bit of an out for some people too, which is unfortunate as well. Yeah, I guess. Um, and also for me too, I had a really great experience um, two or three years ago, a mentor of mine, Professor Stuart McGill, who's, a well-renowned back specialist was, you know, was here in Australia doing a conference and over lunch he was talking to me about the fact that at the age 78, he's fitter and stronger than when he was 50. And when he was 50, he was, you know, researching some of America's top weightlifting and training with these guys. He was a very fit, strong man. So to turn around at the age of 78 and say he's fitter and stronger just kind of blew me away. We got into this big conversation. And so that conversation really started to talk about the way we view recovery as we get older and the way we use mm-hmm. recovery in our training program, but also it was a big conversation on mindset. So most of the time, if you think of a, an 80-year-old person, you're thinking of someone that's in a retirement village in a small room, a one or two bedroom place. They don't go out much. They're old. You know, they turn up to a big room to have dinner, whereas you know, it really comes down to, you know, what your vision is of an athlete and what exercise means to you. And definitions become a big part of that process as well as mindset. Absolutely. For some people, sports and exercise, as I've alluded to in my life, has been part of my life from an early age, but not always. And I guess, does that matter? I mean, I sort of, I just reflecting as I was reading your book, you know, about some of my mindset around exercise, it's sort of like brushing my teeth to me. I don't feel right if I haven't done it every day but that's because I've always done it whereas if you've not done it 
you may not feel like you're missing out and it's a nice to have but you don't you don't need it does that make sense so I'm just wondering what your perspective is on that well there's many ways you could take that question it really comes down to what your version of that is what your definition again of being an active lifestyle so your definition of someone that's been running a lot whereas someone might be farming or they might be in the garden they might have grown up gardening quite a bit so they're a very active lifestyle which is really what we're about but you, your activity levels are about longevity and the quality of your life so Injecting more exercise is really about talking about what movement actually means to you. You know, when I say exercise, that suddenly conjures up the gym. Whereas if I say movement and gardening, or you, know, you might be in the kitchen moving around and pulling the baked roast out of the oven, you know, that's moving on a different level. You're off the couch, you're being active. And that's a big part of what we really need is our physicality as human beings. Yeah, absolutely. Look, a couple of final questions for you that I do ask all my guests. If we spoke again in a year's time, Brett, what would be your number one goal to have achieved and why? Doesn't have to be trail running, by the way. <laughs> oh, actually, I was out walking around Mount Wellington, which is above a big mountain above Hobart. And I, you know, we live in a place called Lena Valley, which is, I'm not sure how many kilometres away, but at Mount Wellington, I saw this hiking sign saying, you know, Lena Valley, that way, no distance, no anything, just a path. And I was like, oh. I wonder if I could run that. How far would that be? Is that 20, 30 kilometres? I'm not sure yet. So that I'll be, touch base with you and see whether you do that or not. That would be a goal if I'm doing that in a year's time. Yeah, I don't know if I can track you on Strava though because I'm probably imagining it doesn't have any kind of, you know, reception out that way. <laughs> I'm not sure if there's reception in that part of um, that way. No. no, excellent. Takeaway message for us today as we wrap up on the politics of exercise. Exercise takeaway message. I think um, one big thing is that, you know, exercise doesn't have, you know, athlete is your definition. And that's really a big concept is finding what your version of an athlete is. And then when you find your version, you can live the life according to your rules, your lifestyle, and set up the conditions that you want, you know, the way you want it to be. So really, a lot of this book started in longevity, started in performance. How do we perform better and, and giving people tools to be able to do that? But before even we have those tools in place, we've got to really have our own version of what an athlete actually is to us. What's our own version of that? So defining is a big part of what an athlete within is all about. Yeah, absolutely. I've loved our conversation and hopefully lots of people will be motivated to to not just grab your book but actually get moving, for not just for today and also the rest of their lives. Thank you so much for your time and I wish you well. Thanks so much for listening today. If you've enjoyed The Politics of Everything, I thrive on your feedback. So please add a short review and share the podcast with your network through Apple, Spotify, and all the usual suspects. I'm always on the hunt for new and diverse guests. So if you or someone you know has a fresh idea you're busting to get out there, please email me at amber at amberdanes.com and my crew will get back to you very soon.